What's good, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Over Quota Podcast. I'm Jay Webb, and this is where I interview founders, CEOs, sales leaders, and top enterprise software salespeople about the keys to consistently exceeding sales expectations. Now, my goal is to give listeners something in addition to the sales coaching that they might already be getting by listening to how other sales leaders, perhaps their peers, and top salespeople have been achieving their success. And I'll introduce my guest in a minute. Um, but first, I want to mention that this podcast is sponsored by my company, the J. David Group. My company helps high growth software companies recruit top software salespeople. So go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash hiring to learn more. We can schedule a call. Or if you're looking for your next big challenge, you can go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash looking. So my guest today is Patrick Gardner. Patrick is the director of inside sales at Exagrid Systems, uh, which is a leading provider of intelligent hyperconverged storage for backup with data deduplication. And Patrick can translate what I just said in a moment. Uh, Patrick, welcome to Over Quota. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. I am excited to be here. Um, you know, and, and nothing gets me more excited than when I hear Patrick and over quota in the same sentence. So that's a good start. It gets me, it gets me going. And, Absolutely. Uh, looking, looking forward to getting into it. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. So let's just start with what I just ended. Talk to me a little bit about your role at Exagrid and what yep. hyperconverged storage deduplication means. Yeah, let me, let me, let me first, yeah, uh, first tell you a little bit about my role here and, and what I do, and then I'll translate what hyperconverged storage means into something that is English, right? So sure. my job here for the last four years or so, um, so I've been with the company for about six years, a little bit more than that. Um, over the last four years, I've been uh, running a team here of what we call account management. Other people might call it customer success, um, whatever you want to call it. But bottom line is we're responsible for the lion's share of the customers here and making sure that they A, stay with us so they continue to use our product, um, that they buy more from us as they need to, um, and that they're happy with the product, right? So we work hand in hand with our support organization, with our SEs, and our renewal team to keep folks on board, make sure they're happy, getting the most bang for the buck, and then obviously a big part of our job is making sure that these customers, um, when appropriate, are expanding the footprint of our system, which brings me to what is hyperconverged storage and all the other stuff you just said. So put put real simply, what we do is we put um, a tiered storage behind backup that allows people to have really fast backups because that's important. You got to finish those backup jobs within a certain period of time, usually six eight hours, sometimes a little bit less than that, and also really fast restores. So if you do have a problem, you have a you know, and a, a SQL server that crashes and you need to get that thing back up and running, you can get it back super fast, right? But also, the reason why we have it tiered is we have a performance tier up front and then what I would call a repository behind that that allows you to have storage efficiency. And, and in a nutshell, what that means is people don't keep one backup, they keep multiple copies of their backups, which can take up a ton of disk, right? If you're putting that stuff on disk and we just allow you to save it on way less disk, you save a ton of money, but you get all the performance benefits. How would you quantify your, uh, your typical or ideal customer in terms of, um, you know, who are they in terms of size? I mean, not, not logos, but. Yeah. So from our standpoint, an ideal customer is probably a company that's got at least $500 million in revenue, but probably more than that. Um, and really it's a company that is going to be keeping longer term retention, right? Because when I say longer term retention, what I mean is multiple copies of their backups going back weeks and months. So really that's financial services, healthcare and SLED are the three ones that come to mind immediately. but. We have tons of companies that make all sorts of random widgets and things like that as well that we work with. Um, so, you know, bigger companies tend to have those needs, but um, they span lots of industries and uh, they, they kind of sit for us in the upper end of the mid market into the enterprise. Got it. Okay. Okay. And talk to me a little bit about your team uh, in terms yep. of the, the, the people, the, the number of people that you're reporting to. And then also just to back up um, even a bit, Give me a sense of the, um, you know, how many people overall in your career you'd say that you manage before we get into some of the tactics. How many people overall? Yeah. Got 
That's a good question. Yeah. See, if you had given me that one in advance, I, I could have done the math. <laughs> um, it, it, it can be approximate. I'm not going to hold it's it. It's got to be probably, you know, when you think all the way down the line, I, I'm probably like in the 80-ish ballpark. You know, I've had teams from 13 to six, you know, they tend to range in, the, in that in that in that ballpark there, and people obviously cycle through. Mm -hmm. um, although we've been pretty fortunate here, where we've had a very low turnover with the team they have now. Um, so yeah, call it call it about eighty as a reference point. Okay, and now at at, at Exegrid, your how large is your team? So we have eight people in Marlboro, right, which is where our headquarters are, and I have an additional person sitting in Dublin in our office over there, and he's responsible for Germany, the UK, Ireland, and um, some of the other uh, Nordic countries. And you mentioned the, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. So I was a total of nine. Okay, and you mentioned a bit earlier in terms of the, the scope of the responsibility of your yep. current team now. Um, throughout the, your career, um, quant qualify for me the kinds of salespeople that you've managed in terms of new business, account managers. That, has it really run the gamut? Give, give the audience a sense of, of that. Yeah, so just to give you a flavor, so I historically have been someone that's either been a hunter or managed hunter teams, right? So um, coming up all the way from my first job out of school as a BDR working for a company that sold fax servers, so if that's not exciting for you, I don't know what is. Um, and back then, fax servers were a big thing. People needed them, and they were the cutting edge. Um, and I was, that's what, that was my job as a BDR. And then I was uh, what we called at that company, a, I think they called us account execs. I don't know. It was so long ago. Um, and then uh, moving on from there, I had you know more new business hunter type roles, and then transitioned into a leadership role managing hunter teams uh, right up until I got here, where I was running a biz dev team, and then took over um, or actually created this account manager team. So this type of role is a little bit um, outside of what my norm has been. It's been mostly hunting, but um, it's it's interesting to uh, approach it from this this angle as well. And so let's talk about some of the differences that you've seen over the years between the best salespeople that you've managed and maybe even yep. some of the practices that, that, that you've, um, you know, as an individual contributor that you may have seen and everybody else. What are, what are some of the differences that you've seen? So in terms of characteristics or practices that the best salespeople have, and this doesn't matter, this could be a hunter. This could be a quote unquote farmer. It really doesn't matter. But one of the big ones that, I, that you know, there's probably a bunch of answers that I can give that everybody you bring on would give as well. But I, I'd start with somebody who's, who will indulge their curiosity, right? So I, and my reps will tell you that I can't even help myself but to indulge my curiosity. So I want to know everything about this company. I want to know where they're located ge geographically. Why does that matter? I don't know why it matters. I just always want to know. When they say we're going to we're going to get on the call with ABC company, like, where are they? Oh, they're in Nashville. They're in California. They're wherever. What do they do? Do they make do they make a piece of technology? Do they make you know a medical device? Do they make paper clips? Are they a financial services company? W what kind of company are they? Um, you know, tell me about the person that we're 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 meeting, and then why are we having this conversation? And and really, the thing that separates your average salesperson from your above average salesperson and one of the things this is more than one is that like just almost uncontrollable toddler like need to to ask all these questions and and the reason why in my opinion and it's i think borne out by experience is that, and why that's important is because you know we all have all these features in our products and they're all most for the most part really good features they all you know it's 2020 now it's not 1999 where if you had a product that actually worked all the time that was a differentiator um, that's not really the case anymore I mean the products are, are out there most of them work um, they have s similar features to your competitors or at least they sound the same to the customer but in order to really position your solution or your product to the customer, you've got to really understand that customer. And it's not because they need backup storage. Like, yeah, okay, that's important. That's kind of like your baseline. But really delving into what is going on and what's driving their decision and why that's important and really kind of peeling back the, all those layers, right? And the best way to do that consistently is if you actually are interested in what the customer has to say. 
right? So curiosity, looking at things from the customer's perspective. I would also say that better salespeople um, have systems that they follow consistently, even when it doesn't pan out for a day. They don't just, you know, change tracks. Um, they batch activities together because you get more efficient and better at them as you go. Um, and then, um, so I, I, I would say, you know, the ability to challenge a customer with finesse, right? So a lot of salespeople will back off when a customer says, well, we're going to do it this way, or I need this or that feature. An A player can say, okay, well, why do you need, why is that feature important? Why do you need that particular functionality? What, what, are, you, what are you trying to get to? Because you might not have the exact feature that the customer is asking for, but maybe you can get him to the end result that he's looking for, or maybe you have a better way to do it. And being able to challenge that customer is a key way to get there that's going to separate you from, I would say, 80% of the people out there. And being able to do that in a way with finesse where you're not coming across as just, you know, argumentative is like, a, a, is another sort of step up over the rest of your peer group. So, you know, we, we all read the book Challenger Sale and all that, and I think that there's a lot of value in it and being able to do that with finesse in a way that's, you know, collaborative versus just, you know, being confrontational and, and most people mean to be collaborative, but they can sometimes come off in a way that just can turn the customer off. So there's some finesse there and that's a key piece to it. How do you enable those behaviors um, or are they enableable? In other words, do they just come, in other words, you mentioned like toddler-like curiosity, right? And you know, I have a six-year-old yeah. and a four-year-old and I was smiling when you said that because, you know, that's all I get in my household, right? And right. so, but, and, and that's, something that uh, that they just come to the table with every day, right? They will wake up with every day. Yeah, their natural inclination is to ask you all these questions and they don't have a hang. And I think the difference is a toddler, right? Even a young kid doesn't have a hang up and doesn't feel like, oh, this is a, st if I ask daddy why he puts um, the, the, the gas thing into the thing and pulls a trigger, I don't sound like an idiot. They don't care about that. So a lot of people have these hangups where they, you know, God forbid you're not the smartest person in the room or God forbid you don't have all the answers or you look like you don't have the answers. And so the first thing I try to, maybe it's not the first thing, but one of the key things is like, I don't care. Like you've known me for a long time. I ask a lot of questions and sometimes you, the first thing I say is, this is probably a really stupid question, but because I don't care if it's a stupid question or not. What I care about is I want the answer. Like, I'm just curious. I want to know and I need to know. And, um, helping them to get over that hump like you're not you, like I'm not going to sit here and judge you for asking that question right that you don't know the answer I mean if it's something you should know the answer to, like how does our product work or something like that it's the tenth time it's come up and you don't know the answer that's that's sort of a different issue but for the most part like just getting them to understand that it's okay to ask a ton of questions and not be Mr. Know-it-all which is probably a turnoff for most people anyway right so how do I enable that I think it's really just kind of unencumbering them from the hangups that they have about asking those questions. And, and it's really more about, you know, getting people to, to start to look at things from the perspective of if you, if you were spending money on this right now, and think about the last time you bought something, like we tend to forget because we're, we're in our own world, right? that the customer's got a lot of other stuff going on. And if you think about the last time you bought something, sometimes the journey looks like this. You recognize that you need something, you go out and you find the details on it, you identify that what you're gonna get, the price, and then you buy it. And sometimes it goes like this. You go out, you do a whole bunch of research, you identify what you wanna get, and then something happens and you forget about it for six months, right? And, it, and so if we don't ask a ton of questions about why that customer needs what they're talking, what they're asking about, what's going on, what they're doing, what the timelines are, what the drivers are, things like that, we can never get them back, you know, kind of, we can never wrangle them back in. But if we know that they're trying, that they have a project coming up where they just acquired another bank and they're going to get, you know, a ton of data that they got to back up in six months, well, we can stay on top of that with the customer. If we know that there's a pain point that goes on where like everything that, everything that happens, it, the thing about pain is it's just like physical pain, right? All the pains that we talk about with customers are like physical pains that you have. If you, if you hurt yourself, you pull a muscle, right? You're going to feel that muscle pull all, all morning. And then you're going to kind of forget about it until you get up from your chair and you feel it again. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's when the customer may or may not come back. But if you can reach out to them and you know what their issues are and what's driving it, then you can actually help move them along and not 
have things get lost. So I think just, yeah, I, yeah. Just, just really understanding that is, is so important. I think this this curiosity thing is fascinating to me because as I, as I work with candidates and and evaluate them, frankly, on their viability as a as a candidate, and frankly, the discussions that you and I have had over the years offline, I think probably informed this as well. But you know, I personally like candidates that are intellectually curious and people that are right. asking the right questions. You know, when I show up at the doctor's office and the first thing he does is open up his laptop when I talk to him about my problems and symptoms, and he's not really asking me a whole bunch of questions, it's concerning because <laughs> I want him to get to the pain, right? I want him to understand right. the pain holistically in a way that, you know, just opening up a laptop or just sort of, I don't know, just, it just, it's a, it's a turnoff, right? It's a disaster. But I guess my question right. is that from a curious, getting back to the whole curiosity thing, because again, it's fascinating. You mentioned enabling them to get over that fear or hang up of not sounding like they don't know anything, right? Like a really right. wanting to being able to, it's okay to ask the question that might be a dumb question, so to speak. Uh, is it that, or is it that they aren't intellectually curious enough to even bring them to even think about asking that question? Like what's sometimes the, it's that, yeah, sometimes they're just not curious enough and you can't make them be curious. Right. right. I've tried. Right. It doesn't work. Mm. Some people just aren't. So with a person like that, what you can do is sometimes people are more process oriented or formulaic. And then you just, you take what you would do as a naturally curious person and you break it and put it into a process, you know? And, and, and so then you can say, look, in order to, to move forward in your process, you need to know all the answers to all these questions. And then it becomes less about them, them in, indulging a in curiosity and more about them working through a process. If they're more process oriented, maybe they're more, I don't know if it's right brain or left, left brain, whatever side of the brain it is that they may lean towards. Um, you know, you, you gotta work to some extent with the strength of the individual and the mindset of the individual. We can't just clone ourselves and, and have them all do it exactly the way we wanna do it and we would do it. But there's, there's more than one way to sort of skin the cat because you might have a very talented salesperson there and they just, you know, they miss that piece of it and by going and making it into a system or process, they sort of get that and they can then, you know, bring their own game up a little bit. You mentioned, I want to go to that too, is you mentioned that as the second point, uh, which is the, the best salespeople have a system that they, that they follow. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit more about that when you say a system that um, they follow. And, and I'm assuming that yep. doesn't necessarily, you mentioned challenger. I'm assuming you don't necessarily mean, okay, they follow challenger, they follow med pick, they follow the, like, talk to me about what they, what you mean when you say uh, they follow. Yeah. The system. So it could be that, right. But it probably isn't. Um, those things are challenger, medic, Sandler, all those things are, are, are philosophies or, or whatever you want to call them that give you tools to execute on a, on a system. When I talk about a system, when I, so a good example is um, at the end of last quarter, I talked to one of our, one of our BDRs here who absolutely crushed it in Q4. He killed Q4. He killed Q3. He killed Q2. Like he's just, he's consistently um, overachieving. And I, I said, I just asked him, I said, Hey, you know, tell me a little bit about what you're doing. Right, because whenever someone does well at something, I don't care if it's a BDR, I don't care if it's a hunter, an enterprise guy in the field, I, I'm always wondering what they're doing because I think there's always little things you can pull, right, and, and apply to different places. And he said, well, Pat, you know, I finally got my system down. He said, I called these types of companies, so he knows exactly what type of companies to call, exactly how big they are, and exactly which people to call. And in, in their world, it's, it's a different kind of a BDR world than a lot of people probably experience where you call and you maybe have one or two conversations and you get somebody into a, you know, you, an MQL or SQL or whatever you're calling it these days, and that's it. For these guys, our sale is so event-driven, you could call someone who's exactly the, the exact profile for the customer we want, but they're not going to buy something today because they just don't. There's no event that's going to kick them over the hump to actually need to spend the money, right? So a lot of it is keeping in touch with these folks over time so that when that, when that event occurs, where A, we're there, and B, the message that we have resonates with them because we can solve their problem in a, in a unique way, 
Um, and it's been sent to them like a thousand times. So when you call them and they're in this pain, pain cycle, you can say, hey, you told me that this, this, and this occur. I can help you with your backup window. I can help you with the fact that you can't scale and you're spending way too much money on that, et cetera. It seems like you're probably there now, and now they're open to it, right? So he, he's got a cadence that he uses was, as his follow-up. He, he, try, he zeroes in on identifying the likely pain points that this customer is going to experience because sometimes you can see him coming, right? And he just, he, just, he just reiterates the message. He asks the questions that get the customer thinking about it. And um, because he's been following that system, things have started to drop for him. And for us, that doesn't mean I put a bunch of stuff in the pipeline. That means we got a bunch of POs. He's found deals, quarter of a million dollar deals this kid's finding over the phone, right? Mm -hmm. And doing a great job of it because he's following a process, right? And underlying all that, yes, there's Sandler stuff and all the other, all the other philosophies that we use, but he knows who he's calling, who within the organization is calling, what the likely issues are that they're, that they're experiencing or going to experience and, how, and messages that in a consistent way, and that's his system. And it works really well for him. And so it's just, a, it's just an example. And my guys have their systems too, and other places I've worked, we've had our systems. And when you, when you, when you execute on a system day after day after day after month after quarter, that's when you get good consistently. It's when you try to jump around and, and everything like that, you can't, you can't ever get any real traction going. You just can't. It's like if, I'm gonna do, if I go to the gym today, um, and luckily you're getting me from here up, so you can't see that. I haven't been to the gym in a while. But if I go and I do cardio, and then like I stop doing cardio, and I start doing strength training, and I stop doing strength training, and I decide to like do like uh, yoga, and then, I, then, three, then a week later I do something else, like I'm never really going to get – any results that I care about, right? Like I might get like a little bit healthier, but you know, I'm not going to be ready to run my personal best in a 5k because I haven't been consistently training. So that's, that's the key is, is you gotta, you gotta figure out the, the process that works for you and stick with it. Right. Yeah. So let's, all right. So let's, let's explore that a little bit more. You know, you mentioned this person on the, the, the BDR team that has his system and everybody should find their system. And if they're able to find their, find a system, obviously that's going to help. When you're working with people that are underperforming and you're coaching people that yep. are underperforming and who knows, maybe they're, you know, maybe they're C players. Um, and we talk about curiosity, talk about having a system and we talk about not being able, able to, uh, not being afraid to challenge their customers. You know, how, how much of, what you just said um, is paramount in, in those coaching discussions. And then, you know, if, if, what else is there if that's not um, exhaustive? And then can you move those folks up from being a C to a B and perhaps even an A, given what we talked about? Yeah, so there's a couple, kind of a couple things packed in there. So let's start with, can you, can you take a C player and make them an A player? Mm -hmm. You can have, if you have someone who is performing at a C level, you might still get them to A level. But if they're truly a C player, the likelihood of getting them to A, I think, is pretty, pretty low. Um, but it sort of depends. Like, why are they a C player? That's my first question. Why is this, per why is this person underperforming? Is it, is it because he doesn't really understand our product? Is it because he doesn't really understand what it does for the customer and really understand the value and why it's important? Is it because he's not putting the work in? Um, and, wh and if that's the case, then there's a whole other bunch of questions. Why isn't he putting the work in? Why isn't he, why isn't he doing the things that he needs to do? And sometimes it's just, you know, helping them find a way, right? Um, you know, in an in a environment like a, a, lo a lot of situations, it's like if, if you leave it up to someone to come in and figure out what to do, they kind of flounder a little bit. Um, and so maybe someone's floundering a little bit and, and they just have lost their way from whatever the formula is that they're supposed to follow. And you come in and say, look, you got to make these calls to these people, send these emails, do these things on LinkedIn, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing and give them that formula. Cause maybe they just, they're just like a rudderless ship, you know, they're just sort of drifting around and they're, they just, they're aimless and they don't know what to do. That, that, that can often be like a crippling thing. Right. And so that's a person that, you know, with direction and a little bit of coaching can probably become a B or maybe even an A player. Maybe they've got the underlying talent. But if the person, you know, frankly, isn't interested in what the customers have to say, they don't really care about whether the, if, they, if they're the kind of person that comes in an interview and they say, look, I'm, I want to be in this just to, I, like I want to make a ton of money. That's why I, why I want to be in sales. We all love that as sales, sales managers, sales leaders, directors, et cetera. 
But if that's all they really care about, and if they could make the same money doing something else that's easier, they would do that. Or they just don't have like a real interest in the job, but they're in the job because they, someone told them they could make a bunch of money or whatever. They probably don't have the stamina for it because because they could be you know, you know there's too many times you get you get knocked down way more times than you than you don't right. Mm -hmm. So it could be that this is somebody that just their heart's not in it. If their heart's not in it, you cannot turn them into an A player. Impossible. If right. someone has has done it out there, I want I want to know about it because I'd love to try it, but. You know, there are just people out there that their heart's not in it. Um, having said that, there's a lot of people that just, you know, need a little bit of, tr of guidance. So for me, right, it depends on the individual. Sometimes it's just a matter of, like, getting them into a, getting them into a good system or teaching them how to ask questions the right way, teaching them to ask questions because maybe you have someone that is great on the technology, they understand the technology, they understand business value if, if you if you if you uh, tee up the conversation such that they can mention it. They understand it. They understand it, and they can talk to it. But maybe they just have a tendency, for whatever reason, to as uh, as an old VP of mine would say, be a demo dolly. In other words, customer says, "Hey, I have I have an interest in your product," and they just go, "Great, let's do a demo." And they just get in, they fire up their demo, and they just run through the features. Right, and the customer just sits back, and the customer just watches you go through feature after feature after feature after feature after feature. After feature. You know, whereas if you can get that person to slow down, ask a few questions, um, and really tailor that that presentation, that demo to the customer, all of a sudden now they're going to be engaged in a much more of a back and forth, and 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 they're going to have far far better luck. So, you know, it's it's just individual things. It's it's it depends on the person. I, I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, can you can you turn a B player into an A player? Yeah, if they want to be an A player. If they right. want to be an A player, you can do it. Um, to, and if they're, you know, they're halfway intelligent and, they, and, and everything else. I mean, the elements have to be there, of course. So it depends. If, you, if you've got someone that's just, you know, not into it, not willing to put the work in and doesn't really give a shit about the customer, they're never going to be an A player. That person will be probably doing something else in a couple of years, and they probably should. One of the best salespeople I ever met, and you know, he continues to just knock it out of the park. I've known him for over 10 years now. I remember his first, I think it might have been his first software sales role. And you know, he was just early out of college and he was absolutely killing it. And when I was talking to his, uh, you know, I think it was the VP of sales and him, I said, well, why are you killing it? What, what's the big difference? And he said, Jay, I don't do any demos. He's like, everybody else is doing demos. I'm not doing demos. He's like, I'm just talking to these customers and they're just buying and they're interested in whatever. And this is a SaaS product and he's not doing any demos. And I was just sort of scratching right. my head and going, holy crap. Like, that's amazing. And the rest of the sales floor at the time was probably only like five or six, maybe seven salespeople. Um, yep. You know, they, that he just didn't do them. And now, you know, he's an enterprise software salesperson now and selling you know, multi hundred thousands of dollars deals. But to your point, I mean, that's, that's he's not he's far from a, a demo dolly um, yeah because he's understanding what the like why why are we here why are we having this conversation and what's driving the customer and so he's having a conversation with about that pointing him in the right direction and if it's a SaaS product there's probably a trial where the customer could go look at it himself on his own time anyway right. and the key thing is you could have a hundred if you have a hundred features the customer probably cares about like three of them maybe mm -hmm. four mm -hmm. and so if you so here's the analogy I like to use Say you go out to a bar, right? And um, I order. I'll, I'm going to use I'm going to use a vodka tonic because this is the, this is the analogy that I used on the person when I first came up with this analogy ten years ago. And that's your drink of choice, right? And they put you know two ounces of vodka in there and uh, eight ounces or however much of tonic. Okay, and that's the right way to do it. Um, if the person puts if the bartender puts two ounces of vodka in there and twenty ounces of tonic, that drink is going to suck, right? Because you're not gonna, you're not even gonna notice that the, that 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 vodka's in there. You're not gonna taste it. You're not gonna. I mean, by the time you finish drinking it all, you're not gonna feel it. It's just not gonna be a very good drink. It's gonna be all out of balance. And it's the same thing with a with a bad demo. Is you've got the same amount of features in there that the customer cares about, but rather than concentrating it down to a two ounce shot, you're giving them, you know, the movie the movie theater size Coke plus the same amount of, uh, of, 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 of rum or whatever your drink of choice is in there, 
and it's just completely, it's completely diluting your entire message. And too many people fall into that trap. And that's, you know, I think, I think anybody who's watching this probably knows that if they care, if they care enough about the craft to, to pay attention to this podcast, they probably already know that, but it's definitely something that happens. Um, and it's, it drives me bananas. You mentioned uh, we spent some time on on systems and, and process, and I'm wondering, as a sales leader, somebody who's, as you mentioned, managed over you know, let's say 80 people or more throughout your career, if if you have to to the degree that you've been able to overachieve as a team, would you put it more on the process and system that you're asking your team to execute? Um, overall, or would you put it on your decision making in terms of hiring the right people or your uh, fortune to have the right people on your team? That's a great question. I always take all the credit, so it's probably <laughs> something that I did with hiring, you know? No, um, so it's a good question, help. right? Mm. Is it exactly with the help of the J. David group? <laughs> um, is, it, is it the person or the process? And so if I had to choose, I would choose the best salesperson, right? But you don't have to choose. And in fact, the reality of it is it depends, right? If I'm, if I'm in a, if I'm in a company that say it's a, say it's a startup company, the product is new, we're evangelizing and we're still trying to find our way. Then it's, it's all about the right salesperson that's going to ask a ton of questions and really, you know, understand the customer and the approach and what's going to work. If I'm in a company that's mature, say it's a, it's a transactional environment, um, and, and it's pretty like, you know, if you follow the system and follow, and follow the steps, you know, you're going to be, you're, you're going to be in good shape. Then it's more about the process. But I, I'm going to say this, it's about finding the right person for the process, right? Because once you have a system in place, you could have a process that looks like uh, a two day sales cycle where someone downloads a form or signs up for a trial or <clears throat> hits your website and, and expresses an interest in a product that's a low dollar dollar product, um, low barrier to, to entry in terms of getting in, in terms of purchasing or getting signed up. Um, that's going to be a totally different animal than if you have something that costs five hundred thousand dollars and is like a ninety day sales cycle, right? So it's kind of like saying, well, Pat, if you're building a house, do you need plumbers or carpenters? And I would say, you know. It depends. It depends on if I if I'm running the water, I need a plumber. If I'm if I'm building, you know, the frame and the walls or whatever, then I need the then I need the carpenter. Um, so it, it's really important to match the person with the 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 process or the you know the buying cycle or patterns of the, of what you're selling. And I think we can fall into the trap of hiring people that were, you know killer enterprise, not enterprise, you're not going to hire an enterprise person for like a, you know, more of a, a SMB type role, but, you know, looking at somebody and saying, wow, that person killed it over there, but maybe this is a different cadence, you know what I mean? Like, you got to, you got to match the person with the, 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 the process, the product, the market, all that stuff. So the answer, the short answer is you really need the right person, but you need to fit them into the right system. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. You know, it's like sticking a, an A battery into a slot for a, a D battery. It, it Maybe the best A battery out there, but if that's not the right, that's not what that system calls for. What's the point? You know, your flashlight's not going to light up. Yeah, right. And, and and so, how do you tease that out during the interview process, or extract that out dur during interviews to find out? Because you know your system, obviously, and you, and you yep. whatever, whatever that might be how do you evaluate candidates on an individual basis to say, okay, this is going to be the right person for the right process. And I know there's no purpose. So if they've, if they've done it before, right. If they've, if they've, if they've been in an environment with a similar sale, then it's pretty easy, right. Cause I can just ask them about some of their experiences, how they like to approach things, um, how they run a sales cycle um, and walk me through some of the deals that they've done. Sometimes I ask them about deals that are in their forecast, like things like that, right? Because then they'll tell you about what they're doing. And if it, if it meshes, if it seems like what they're doing meshes, not maybe, maybe not perfectly, but close enough to what you're doing, that tells me that they can, they can operate in that environment and that, they, and that, that that's a good sign. Um, if that person hasn't 
than say it's somebody who's been more transactional and they want to move into like a like a larger sale that's less transactional, maybe more um, complex, then it's a little bit more difficult, right? Because I can't just say, well, tell me about a time we ran this complex sale because they probably haven't. Um, but I may like this person anyway, right? And so then I'm probably, you know, I'm watching, I'm watching how they work with me in the interview process. That's very telling um, over time. I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to just their thought process. So tell me why you ran that sale the way you did. And if they just say, well, because, you know, I called him and he, he wanted uh, a, a quote and I sent him a quote and then he bought it, well, then, the, then a complex sale that involves multiple people is probably not the right approach. Um, I'll hit them with some hypotheticals and, and they probably may get the answer wrong. But if they're thinking it through and asking questions and really understanding where I'm coming from, then that's somebody that might be able to, to, that may be able to make the, the transition, right? So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's kind of how I approach it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. And as they're walking you through your, their, their sales process, um, and let's say, for instance, they, let's, let's just say, for instance, on paper, so to speak, they have, yep. uh, you know, sold to similar size accounts, let's just say, uh, you have an understanding that there is a comp that, that they're running managing a complex sales process. Are there any ind indicators that um, will tell you one way or another beyond the stuff that might just be the obvious to tell you, yep, okay, this person is going to be a fit. This person's not going to be a fit. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of it is how, and how they answer the questions, right? Mm -hmm. So if they can answer the questions, especially if on paper if they match up. Mm -hmm. Um, with some specifics and, you know, depth, then I'm feeling a lot more comfortable than if they're giving me generalities, right. you know? Um, so I guess I'm, I'm you know, oh, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit, I'm showing you the cards a little bit, but the word typically to me is like a fire alarm going off when I hear the word typically. Right. Like typically I do this and typically I do that. Well, OK, what does that mean? Typically, like, do you when have you done it? You know, and have you done it recently? And was it one time where you sort of fell into it or what is what do you mean? Usually, like, I don't get it. But if they say, well, last quarter I closed this deal and I walked through this and I did this, and I did that and boom, boom, boom. And they're, and they're speaking specifically about an actual event that occurred versus a general hypothetical approach, I'm much more comfortable with that person that they can do that and that they will do it and that they, or they can transition into, you know, a different, a different uh, selling cycle because they've thought it through, they're doing it, they're telling me what they've done versus, you know, feeding me what they think I want to hear because they, what they read on LinkedIn about what hiring managers ask, you know what I mean? Yes. Right. And, and I, the I'm other, the other mm -hmm. thing too, sorry to interrupt. The other thing though is there's a pretty good chance that I know somebody that knows that person and I've talked to them. Hmm. Right. Um, and usually I'll say, Hey, you know, you know, this person or that person, do you mind if I give them a call? Hmm. And first of all, the reaction tells you a lot right there, unless they're like a really good poker player, which some, a lot of people are, and that's okay. Um, but then you can talk to them and, and um, they'll flush out for you too. Like, how does this person really operate on a day to day basis? You know, even if the person says, I'm going to call Sean Lally, right? You and I both know Sean Lally, and I'm going to tell him that you're calling, calling him and going to ask these questions. And, he, you know, and maybe, maybe Sean's inclined to help this, this guy out because they, they, they know each other and, and he likes them and everything like that. But I'm going, to get a, I'm going to get another layer of information from a different angle that's going to give me a, a complete picture, right? And so... Um, I guess the other lesson in that is when you answer questions that I'm asking, they better be the actual answers. Because if I find out that you've been feeding me a line that's not true, I'm going to have a problem. Because how can, I, how can I trust you going forward if you're not being honest with me, right? So, so let's, yeah, let me dig into that a little bit and say, because obviously there are people that are coming to you and coming to me and just it's just part of life right where you're going to yep. have shortcomings and not everything is going to be rosy right if someone's coming to you and they're let's say they're off a down quarter or they've had a down year yep 
under what circumstances do you give, you know, are you not sympathetic, but just, I, also, I, I guess, understanding to that? And how should a candidate well, express themselves? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, I was thinking about this question the other day. And so here's the, here's the, let me just say this first and foremost. Anybody who thinks that they've never hired a person coming out of that position is fooling themselves. And, the, and, the, and, the, and let me tell you how I know that they're fooling themselves and how they'll know how they've, that they've been fooling themselves. If you've ever put a person on a PIP, a 45, a 30 day, a 90 day PIP, and a week later that person's walked into your office and said, oh, I found something else, I'm giving you my resignation. You're like, oh, thank God, now I don't have to fire that person. If you don't think you've ever been on the opposite side of that transaction, you're, 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 I'm sorry, you're, you're kidding yourself. It's just, it's happened, I guarantee it. There's just too many times where it's happened and, and, and so forth. So first of all, mm -hmm. don't think you've never done it and don't think you don't ever hire someone that's coming off not a perfect quarter because it's, it's probably not true or you haven't been around long enough or you're, or you're just lucky. Or maybe you're just so good at flushing that stuff out, but I highly doubt it. So first and foremost, I think we need to accept that. The second thing is, so if someone's coming off um, a down quarter, uh, a down year, uh, whatever, when would I sort of overlook that, assuming I know it in this case, which, you know, usually you do, right? But so first of all, there's a lot of reasons why people may not be successful in every role, in every, in every job that they're in. Um, and so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta look at that. I mean, sometimes you just know, right? You see the resume, you're looking at the company the person was at and you're like, oh, that company. Nobody does well at that company. Everybody struggles there. Um, you know, the, the average tenure for that company is six months. So I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to worry about that because I just know that that's a company that people have a hard time at, right? If they've been there for a long time, then I'm going to be like, oh, wow, that person lasted for a while there. I wonder why. So first of all, you know, where, what are they coming out of, right? It may, it may have nothing to do with them as a salesperson. Now, having said that, sometimes people come out of companies where that's not the case. Um, and sometimes it's just like, you, you know, you talk to people and you just get the sense that the last job they were in just wasn't a good match for them, hmm. right? Like I've, like, I've had people that have worked for me that have, we've parted ways and they've gone on to be successful and they, you know, they were at their next company for two years or three years or whatever. And it's not because suddenly they became twice as good a salesperson as they were before, maybe, but probably not. It probably was just a better match, right? So if, say you, you're hiring somebody for, a role that, you know, is more of like a consultative, complex, 90-day, 60-day sales cycle, and they're coming out of a transactional environment, and they maybe didn't, you know, light it up in that environment. It may just be that that type of sale is not for them. Mm -hmm. But why should that bother me if, if I'm not hiring for that, right? So I, I want to know the circumstances the person's coming out of. I mean, the reality is we're all going to, we're all going to, go to a company that's either the product's not going to be ready for prime time, the product's going to be too early for the market, right? Or who knows? It could be company issues, product issues, the market wasn't quite what it's supposed to be, um, or maybe it just wasn't a match for them, right? And then they find, they find their home, so to speak, and uh, they can do really well. So I don't like to just look at someone and say, oh, they had a, you know, they got they got, uh, they got run out of the last place they were at, that person's not going to be successful here too. I mean, if they've got, you know, a string of it over time and everything's eight months or 12 months and nothing's gone past that, then that's obviously a red flag. But if they've got, you know, the average tenure now is what? You'd probably know this better than I do, what, 18 months maybe? Well, for, for yeah, the, hard, the more responsibility you have, the shorter that gets, frankly. You know, I mean, if you're a rep, it might right. be, it might be, you know, let's call it 24 months to, th to, to three years. But if you're a director or VP of sales and up, it's, yeah, it's like 18 months. Right. So say it's, say it's a year and a half to two years and someone's, you know, if someone's only ever been someplace for nine months, okay, that's probably a red flag. But if, you know, if they've been a bunch of places for those, that two year, three year mark, and they have a, they have a, uh, a bad, a bad stint somewhere, you know, who, know, who knows what the reasoning is and you got to dig in and find out. So I guess, you know, I've talked to people that have come out of situations like that and I, and I hear them tell me about the product they sell and who they're selling to. And I'm like, yeah, there's no market for that. Mm. Like, I'm amazed that someone gave that company millions of dollars to fund them. Like, I, like I would never give that company millions of dollars to, to, to be funded. So yeah, I'm not surprised that you had a hard time selling that. Um, 
so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but for me, I, you got to look beyond like the last. And, and by the way, it goes both ways. You know, if the person was at 200 percent their last at their last company, it doesn't mean they're going to come in and be 200 percent for you. Hmm. In fact, I'd be I'd say that there's a good chance that that person might be so wedded in doing the in doing the, the things the way he was doing it before that if you don't match up nicely with that, it may be hard to get them to, to um, adapt. But if they're an A player, they'll probably adapt. So. Right, right, right. And I would imagine that soft skills have to play a major role. Let's say, for instance, if it's not evident that the company that they're coming from is, you know, a, a known place where people aren't going to last long, right? And let's say, for right. instance, there, is, there isn't necessarily a back channel to verify some of those things. And soft skills really play a major role as well. Is that, that that's that's correct, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And a lot of that will come out during the resume, uh, during the interview process. Um, mm -hmm. th those types of things that are less, that are more difficult to define and and put in like a box, you know, come out. And and a lot of it is like, you know, you you've probably ha you've probably been on the on the receiving end of a conversation like this with me when you have sent me resumes and I and you said, Pat, what do, what do you think of of so and so? I said, Ah. I don't know, Jay, I talked to him, I don't think so. And you say, well, Pat, he checks all the boxes. I know, but I talked to him and he's not gonna be the right guy or not gonna be the right gal because he's just, his presence on the phone's not good or you know, he doesn't ask good questions or, or flip it, right? The person doesn't look like they'd be an ideal match, but you talk to them and, they, and, and over multiple conversations, they ask great questions, they have insights, they, you know, are, are able to um, answer your questions in a coherent way. And it's just like you just said, this is somebody that I would like to talk to my prospects, right? Because I can trust them to have a good conversation with my prospects and actually, you know, run the sales process in a, in a way that, that that's going to work for him and for, and, for the, and for the customer. So, yeah, the soft skills, it's really hard to define. And, and, and like... <laughs> Phone presence. What the hell does that mean, right? Like, I know what it means. You know what it means. But try defining it. Good luck. Right. You know, uh, other than you can articulate the words or enunciate the words, like, okay, but how do you convey that sense that the person gets energy through the phone? It's it's impo It's I don't know if it's impossible to do. It's impossible for me to do. I'm not poetic enough to to communicate that. But um, things like phone presence are are a big deal. And so, you know, someone has a good presence on the phone. Someone comes in and has, has a, good, um, a good interview. Someone who, as you're, as you're taking them through the office, they interact with people in a way that you can see that they know how to interact with people. Because mm -hmm. not everybody does, and not every salesperson does. You'd be su maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but I'm still surprised when I, when I bring a, sometimes a, a veteran salesperson through, and the way they interact with them, I'm just like, that's how you interact with people? No, that's not cool. Or conversely, you bring someone through and like, you know, they know to what degree to interact. Like there's interacting and then there's like too much. Like, no, don't, I don't need you to have a 10 minute conversation with the person I just wanted you to say hi to. Like knowing, like reading that situation is like, that's a skill. And that's something that translates to I'm on the phone with my customer and how far do I push him? How, dig do, how deep do I dig? How do I, how do I elicit additional information out of him so that I can understand what he's trying to do and position and position what I'm selling? So it, it's, it's all very hard to define. Um, it's not something you can put on a resume, um, but it's important. Yeah, and you mentioned phone presence. I was talking to someone last week that, you know, I liked him. I thought his, I thought his skill set was, was dead on. Um, I thought he asked really good questions. The only thing that was really concerning to me was his energy was low. And I told him, and I've told people this for years, I said, do me a favor. And, you know, it wasn't your company, obviously, but I said, do me a favor. When you meet with, you know, let's say Patrick, or when you talk to Patrick on the phone, stand up while you're yep. talking to him. Maybe pace a little bit, right? Because your energy yep. right now is really low. And I told him, I go, yeah. honestly, I'm like, I'm my energy. You might even notice that my energy is low right now because I was sitting and I was talking to them because I was taking notes, right? But I'm not the one that's interviewing, right? And so I said, right. it might, it might, it, you know, it might have just been a little bit of that 
where he was matching my energy and I have a deep voice. So maybe he was just sort of, you know, it was just one of those things. And I told, and I yeah. told him, I said, listen, I've got low energy right now. I'm not pacing. I'm not walking around. Um, but I said, if I really need to ramp it up, that's what I'll do. I'll stand up. I'll go, I'll get in my car. I'll do whatever it is that I'll do, but I'll change my, you know, as the Corona commercials say, right. I'll change my latitude. Um, there you to go. Make it, effective so i think those things are really important um yep. as well and also and, and, mm -hmm. and by the way now we have wireless we have wireless headsets it's not like the old days where we were tethered like like right. a like a dog you know <laughs> where, where you could only you could only move like in like a four foot radius you know right. you can get up and walk around with these things um yes. you know i used to i used to drive people bananas that sat around me back when i was a rep because i had a we had we had done a, an event and i had a ball that when you bounced it on the ground it would light up Right. So that that engaged me in two different ways. One is I could I could bounce the ball while I was talking to the customer, but it lit up. So it was kind of cool. Uh, but it drove everyone around me crazy. So I had to find a spot in the office where I could bounce the ball on the ground and talk to people because it would, it did, you know, it allows you to have a higher energy level. And that is an important thing, whether you're interviewing. It's definitely important when you're interviewing and it's important when you're talking to your customers as well and your prospects. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I'll give you one other soft skill example, which is that I, it's, this is probably several, about seven or eight years ago. Uh, one of the, was the VP of sales hired one of my candidates. And one of the things he told me, and again, my candidate was coming off of basically like a bad quarter or whatever, a bad year yeah. or so, but he had been with the company, for, I think for about six or seven years. And, you know, the last year or so things had just gone downhill internally with the company or whatever. But he, he said to me, he said, his name was Craig. He goes, I like Craig because he was unapologetic about his career. Right. In other yeah. words, he just sort of told me the facts, right? Like this is what, this is what happened. Like this is what went down. And he wasn't shy about it. He wasn't, you know, you could tell when you talk to him that he wasn't holding anything back, that he wasn't trying to hide something. And yeah. it, just, it just radiated and said, all right, like this, this, this guy inspires the, enough confidence in me where he's going to get the job done. And he did. Right. And he's, and he's, and he's, and he's just, he is a, a fantastic rep. So something that. So that's somebody who has a like. quiet confidence about them. And that is a trait that is so valuable in a salesperson because a, the confidence to be honest and the courage to be honest is important. Obviously in an interview process, this is, these are people going to work with, we're depending on them. They're depending on us. Like we have to be able to work together. We have to be able to trust each other, but a customer is going to buy from you if they can trust you. If they can't trust you, it's going to be really hard for them to pull the trigger and buy something from you, but they aren't going to, and this is, I guess, where I go back to the word finesse too. Like they, they don't want to hear you brag. And they don't want to hear you brag about the product. And yeah, like you should definitely mention your, your blue chip customers, but do it in a way that's engaging with the customer. And that's that kind of quiet confidence. Like, look, Mr. Customer, I know you're going to look at other, I know you're going to be looking at other products. I know there's this three or four ways you can skin this cat. Let me tell you about how we do it. And let me, t let me, let me tell you how it addresses the things that we've talked about that are important to you in a way that's just really matter of fact, um, confident, and like you said, unapologetic is a good way to put it because guess what? You don't do every single thing that your customer is going to ask you if it, if it does. It, like there's going to be some obscure feature or function that you don't have and, you know, you can't oftentimes hide that and you probably shouldn't hide it. You should probably understand why they're asking about it and be, and be confident enough to, to, to address that, that issue head on because otherwise you're just – planting a, a time bomb in your own sales process. So that kind of thing where they're, unap uh, as you put it, unapologetic or, or, you know, courageous enough, however you want to put it. Mm -hmm. um, I had, I had one VP of sales describe as, as sales courage. It's a really, it's a great way to put it because you have to have that sales courage where you're saying something that on paper isn't going to help you advance your sale. Like telling them that you don't do X or asking the customer an uncomfortable question theoretically isn't going to, isn't going to move the ball in your favor, but in fact, you have to do those things. You have to have the courage to do them. Yep. That's right. That's right. So speaking of that, and this is, I'll get you out on this last question is if someone were, um, you know, wanted to go and work for you, wanted to go and work for Patrick Gardner or just Exegrid in general, um, yep. are, A, are you hiring? Um, for which positions, if you want to, to say, and then how else, how, how can people get in touch with you to apply? Yeah. So we are always looking for good talent here. I know we have openings on our biz dev team. We're looking for on that group. It doesn't report to me directly. Um, it doesn't report to me at, at all anymore. I used to, used to, um, but we look for really solid, um, 
really good experience BDRs. Well, we well, we don't call them BDRs, but that's 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 the bucket that I would put them in. So we're we're, look, we're always looking for them, either in our Bedford office or here in Marlboro. Um, on my team right now, we're staffed up, but I'm always on the lookout because you know as Exagrid continues to grow, my team grows and we're growing. So I always need to know who's out there, who's good, and 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 everything like that. So I'm always, as you know, I, I'm always asking you like, hey, how can we get some more names in the pipeline? I'm sure that's a question you love getting from me when I'm not really going to hire someone anytime soon. But I am always looking for those types of people. Um, and so the so the best way to get a hold of me, I would say, is um, hit me up on LinkedIn, Patrick Gardner at Exagrid, or you know however you want to search for me, and um, and and shoot me a note. Shoot me, a, shoot me an intro. Connect with me. Um, don't just connect with me blindly, though. So I'll give you another little, uh, you know, insider into my, my way of thinking. Just the, the generic invitation, I'm probably not going to, I'm probably not going to accept. I look at everything. I don't know what other people do. I know a lot of people can't look at all their stuff or they don't or whatever. I actually look at all the invites and I, but if, they, if there's nothing there, then I'm probably just going to delete it and move on. But if there's like, a, if there's something intelligent in there, I'm going to look at it and say, all right, well, this, this person took some time and, and they were, they made an effort to be non-generic, right? So I, I, I want to connect with that person and then, you know, keep an eye, keep an eye on it and check in with me regularly. Like, honestly, the best way to answer that question, I guess I'd say use, use solid like sales skills. Like if I wanted to get into a company to sell to them, I wouldn't just like say, hey, do you want to buy some uh, um, uh, tiered uh, backup storage today? And when they say, no, not today, never talk to them again, right? I would say, hey, this is what we do. Do you have a need for this? You know, we solved this, this, and this problem. Do any of those ring true? No, not really right now. Cool, thanks. And then I'd, but I'd stay in touch with that person over time. And, that, and that, that's, that's what people should do. And, and frankly, you should do that anyway because in this industry, so many things change so quick. You just never know. Today we're not hiring somebody. Tomorrow I could have a meeting with my CEO and I could need three people to do something totally different. So um, the short answer to your question, Jay, because that was a very long answer, is hit me up on LinkedIn and uh, let's get in touch. And when I and then when I need another, you know, a player, uh, you'll be at the top of my radar. And by the way, this podcast is actually the antidote, if you will, if that's the right word, to your question of Jay, how can we get more people in the in the pipeline when you're not immediately looking? I say, okay, Patrick, how about just come on this this interview? You can share what you just yeah. shared. I'm going to share this podcast with as many people as possible. And if they listen all the way through, and I know they will because this has been captivating, then they will reach out, you know, and by the way, guys and girls mention the over quota podcast as you're reaching out to Patrick to say, right. um, because obviously, as he just said, you know, he wants to see something beyond a, a generic uh, sort of reach out. I think specifically citing this podcast will certainly help. Uh, perhaps yep. maybe bubble you to the top and, yep. um, and and yeah, it'll just be a good way to do it. And, and maybe you just want to say thank you for the wisdom that he shared here today and the knowledge that he shared, because I want to say thank you um, for this. This has been um, very, uh, very good. And you can see I'm taking a lot of notes here uh, because I always learn throughout these interviews as well. And Patrick, congratulations because you've just gone over quota. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. Goodbye, everybody. I'm Bye. cueing the music.